Now, when I was at school, I had some teachers who, uh, even if their lessons were demanding, it was kind of good to be around them and you could tell that they were on your side uh, and they wanted you to do well and they were looking for ways for you to, to move on and improve in the subject. And I hope everybody's had that experience. But I've also had the opposite experience, and probably most of you had this as well, of teachers who weren't so much like that and who, whatever you did, it was never good enough for them. And you would almost feel they were looking for ways to knock marks off what you'd done and trying to find fault with what you'd done. And uh, probably everyone's come across a teacher who says, I never award 100%. So even if you do something perfectly, you still only get a 90 because that's just his policy for some reason. Uh, it can be disheartening. Now, here's the thing. If you're thinking about being a Christian, even if you're deciding, is this for me? Is this what I'm going to do with my life? If you're thinking about dedicating your life to God, the big question is this. Can he be trusted? What one of those teachers is he like? Is he fundamentally on your side? Or is he looking to find fault? Uh, is he dangerously unpredictable? Will he taunt us by offering us good things and then snatching them away? Or will he look for reasons to deny us the things that we want and need? You know, last time I was preaching, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how Jesus taught us to pray our Father in heaven and that that shows us that God is both our Father and our King. But I'm painfully aware that for some of us, the idea that God is like a Father isn't necessarily a very positive thing for some people your father maybe wasn't so great uh, as a father and maybe he was unpredictable. Maybe he punished you harshly for things that you didn't really know what you'd done. Maybe when you think about God as a father, perhaps you, there's part of you that thinks, is that what he's like? So, can he be trusted? That, that for me is the big question. And today we're going to look at three short passages of Jesus's teaching. And we'll see what we're going to discover. Now, all of these are from the Sermon on the Mount. They're close together in Matthew's Gospel. And everything I'm going to read to you today from the Bible are the words of Jesus himself. So let's start with the first one, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. He says this, When you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, because they try to look miserable and disheveled, so people will admire them for their fasting. I'm telling you the truth. That's the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face, and then no one will notice that you're fasting, except your Father, who knows what you do in private. And your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Now this passage is about fasting, which is the practice of going without food, uh, to, to make time and demonstrate sort of seriousness around praying. Uh, but Jesus made exactly the same point about other kinds of prayer as well. Uh, just 11 verses earlier, in Matthew 6, same chapter, verses 5 and 6, he says, When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. For the same reason. Because the point's this. Your spiritual disciplines, the time that you spend with God, are about the time that you spend with God. Whether anyone else knows about them is at best irrelevant. What matters is this, and this is really my first point. If you're taking notes, write this down. God sees us. You remember the last thing we read in that passage was this. Your father who sees everything will reward you. The time that we spend there is about time with God. We're not praying to impress other people. We're certainly not fasting to impress other people. Uh, and another thing, that I've, I've sometimes seen this happen, if you're praying for someone to be healed, praying for a sickness, then sometimes it just creeps into the back of my mind and thinking, oh, you know what, because we're praying for this person, they know that we're praying, they know that we care about them, and that'll make them feel better, and uh, that has some value. How nice. But, you know, that's really not the point. That's not what Jesus is encouraging us to do when we pray. Um... Uh, we're not looking for some kind of placebo effect. Uh, the point is this. When we pray, we're speaking with God. And it's a God who hears us and who sees the way that we pray and fast in private. Now, I just want to clear up a possible misunderstanding. Of course, I'm not saying that all public prayer is bad. You know, if you're leading a group in prayer, 
it's really useful for someone to be able to do that, to help everybody to come together and pray the same thing. But the goal of that, of course, is to point people to the God that we're all praying to, not to point to yourself, the person who's praying, not like the people that Jesus was talking about in this passage. Uh, and in fact, in terms of praying together, I, I want to remind you all, we have a prayer workshop this very evening, 7.30. If you've not already had the email telling you how you can join in with that, uh, you can email connect at fcchurch.co.uk. And I'm sure Darren will uh, put that email address in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. Connect at fcchurch.co.uk. You can join us tonight and we'll go through the Lord's Prayer, uh, which we touched on briefly a couple of weeks ago and see how it can help us in our praying. But the substance of this passage that we just looked at is this. God sees us in secret and rewards us. Now here's the sec second short passage. Um, and before I come on to that, I just want to note we've skipped over here. We've gone from halfway through Matthew 6 to halfway through Matthew 7. We've skipped the best part of a chapter. Um, and partly that's because it's uh, the section Steve McCoy is going to be talking about next weekend at the fun weekend. So I don't want to talk about it too much now. I don't want to tread on his toes. But I will just say this. Most of it is about not worrying. It's about trusting God. So with that in mind, uh, let's move on and look at this next passage. Now in Lewis Carroll's poem, The Hunting of the Snark, he, he says, what I tell you three times is true. And that's always stayed with me. It's quite a resonant sort of idea that when someone says something three times, they're serious. And it's true, isn't it? You know, people care, really care about something. They really want you to know it. They'll tell you it over and over again. And think, for example, about the bit at the end of John's Gospel after Peter has denied Jesus. And then after the resurrection, the risen Jesus meets Peter and asks him, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. He asks him again. And Peter answers again. And then Jesus asks him a third time. And what's happening is he's drawing Peter out into saying three times, yes, Lord, I love you. Because it's that important that he grasps it, that he gets it. So this idea that you repeat something three times to really get it through, I think is very powerful. So with that in mind now, let's read that second passage. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 8. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be opened. Now look, Jesus is telling us the same thing three times, isn't he? He's doing here exactly what he got Peter to do at the end of John's Gospel. He's telling us the same thing three times in three different words. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Why? Because God answers those prayers. Everyone who asks receives, Jesus tells us. And then again, everyone who seeks finds. And then again, a third time, to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. So what this means that he tells us it three times is that it's something he really, really wants us to understand. And all those thousands of people spread out on the hillside listening to him when he first said this, he really wanted them to understand that God hears us. That when we're praying, when we ask for things, when we're seeking, those words aren't just drifting off into hyperspace or just bouncing off the ceiling. God himself hears us. Now, in the first passage, we noted that God sees us. Now, in this passage, we're seeing that God hears us. Now, this is in the context, of course, of the passage in between that we skipped over, which is about how God can be trusted. Now, this passage isn't about a prayer technique. Uh, I don't believe it's about persistence, although the New Living Translation that we read here says, ask and keep on asking. Um, most translations don't do that. So, for example, the New International Version just says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. And the reason why you get these slight differences in the translations is because uh, the tense that's used in the original Greek, so I'm told, uh, I'm no expert on this, but so I'm told is a tense that, that conveys the idea of something that's ongoing, that's not just done once, but that keeps happening. But I don't understand this to be about persistence. It's not saying keep on coming back to God over and over, saying the same words, asking for the same thing. In fact, you remember 
uh, as Tim pointed out last week, we're actually told uh, in the same passage that there's no, we don't just need to keep repeating ourselves in praying. God knows what we need. So I think what this is about is not repetition and current persistence. It's just about staying in God's presence. It's about lifestyle of asking and of seeking and of knocking. Not just a one-off, not just to get a thing, but because we are people who keep coming back to God to ask, to seek, to knock. Why? Because we know that he hears us. We know that he can be trusted. And here's the third and final passage we're going to look at. It follows straight on from the one we just read. So we're still in Matthew chapter 7. And now starting from verse 9, Jesus says this. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Now this last section explains itself, doesn't it? It's all about the goodness of God. If we ask him for a good thing, he won't give us a bad thing. I almost feel there's nothing more to be said about it. It explains itself. Do you know, when I read the Sermon on the Mount, I always feel Jesus seems quite cheerful. He's, uh, I kind of hear a twinkle in his eye as he's speaking, if you like. I mean, you can't hear a twinkle in the eye. You know what I'm getting at. So when I read this bit, I, maybe I'm reading into it. I don't know. But it seems to me when I read, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts? He's saying, don't you see that God is so much better than you realized? So much better than any of us. So much better than any, heaven, um, any earthly father. And the point here that's being made is that God gives to us. Now, in Luke's gospel, when this same story is told, uh, it's recounted slightly differently. So, um, uh, partly because it has a scorpion in it this time, but more importantly, the punchline. Listen carefully, I'll read it to you. You fathers... Jesus says, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do You see the difference here. In Matthew, we're promised good things in a very general way. But Luke narrows right down on the most important of all the good things God can give us, and that is himself. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? Um, I don't want to get into the deep waters of the doctrine of the Trinity here, but Christians believe that, that God is one God in three persons, God the Father, uh, and then Jesus, who walked on earth, and the Holy Spirit is the way that God appears to us here and now, in our hearts, in our minds, on this earth. So the promise here, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What Jesus is promising is that God will give himself. What better thing could he give? So in these three passages, I hope we've seen three things. In the first one, that God sees us. In the second one, that God hears us. And in the third one, that God gives us good gifts. So the answer to the question we started with, can God be trusted, is a resounding yes. It's a resounding yes. He's not like that cruel school teacher who's looking for ways to knock marks off. He's on our side. And the thing we need to wrap our heads around is that everything we love in this life is only a dim and hazy reflection of the goodness of God himself. You know, I think about things I like, uh, football, dinosaurs, beer, sushi, sunshine. Uh, other people, my friends, my family, all of these things, all of them, understood properly, point to the goodness of God. They're demonstrations of aspects of God. And the promise of Jesus is that God himself will give himself to us. Now, if you're in the orbit of the church, but not a member, if you've been kind of hanging around with us for a while, and maybe turning up on Sundays, and maybe we don't even know you and you've just been keeping an eye. You maybe have picked up on some of the things this church does. Uh, and perhaps you think, well, I, I like that this church hosts the food bank, 
I like that they're running Christians Against Poverty. It's good that they're doing neighborhood chaplains and various other bits and pieces that we do, Common Ground Cafe and so on. But maybe you say to yourself, why do they have to keep bringing God into it all the time? Why can't they just do these good things and let that be enough? I want to answer that question, and it's really simple. And please hear me. The reason we keep bringing God into it is because God is the best thing that we have to offer. He's the best thing that anyone has to offer. Uh, and if you ask people who've been through Christians Against Poverty and who've become Christians as a result and joined the church, if you ask them what was the most significant thing that happened on that program, they won't tell you that it was getting debt free. They'll tell you that it was starting to understand the goodness and the greatness of God, starting to come towards him, starting to respond to his initiative. You know, he, God himself is the best thing anyone has to offer. And the reason for that is because we were made by him and for him. He is the answer to all of our questions. Uh, and if this is a new idea to you, or if it's one you're just starting to get used to, please, I, I just ask you, follow it up. Just keep pushing in. Look for him. Start to see him. I always think about the prayer of Richard of Chichester. If you've heard me preach before, you've almost certainly heard this prayer before. So short, so economical, and so wise. His prayer to God was saying, I want to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly. And that is always how it goes, folks. It begins with seeing him, with starting to understand more of what he's like. And the more we see him, the more we love him. A couple of days ago, I saw an article in a, a, a newly launched academic journal. It's called the Journal of Controversial Ideas. It launched last month. And the title of this article, I didn't read the article, I just read the title. It was Ultimate Meaning. We don't have it, we can't get it, and we should be very, very sad. Now, I don't know whether the scholarship was any good, but I, I do know that everything about that title is wrong. Ultimate meaning. We do have it. We can get it. And as a result, we're very, very happy. And it all comes down to this one simple reason. God can be trusted. God is good. God is great. And God can be trusted. So stay with us, please, as we, as we try to explore more of what he's like, as we try and open up his character, uh, and as, as every one of us involved in this church try to come closer to him ourselves, to see him more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more nearly. Uh, and I pray that we'll be a blessing to you as we do that, and more importantly still, that God himself will be a blessing to you. Amen.